Hey guys, and welcome back to yet another Lost Bits video right here on Tetra Bay Gaming, the series where we explore noteworthy scrapped, unused, and unseen content in video games. In this video, we will be exploring Mario's second big RPG style game, the original Paper Mario on the N64. This game has lots of cool stuff to see, so to help me out, I've enlisted the help of glitcher extraordinaire, Mikey Taylor Gaming. Thanks Tetra, and hello everybody! I really hope you like unused content, because we have a ton for you all today. And as always, really quickly before we start, if at any point you guys do enjoy this video, be sure to slap a like down below, it seriously helps me out a lot. And then after this video, if you want to check out even more Paper Mario goodness, be sure to head over to Mikey's channel and see his new Glitch Picnic video with a certain cool guest. And with all of that fun stuff out of the way, go grab some bandages because we're gonna get some serious paper cuts, it's time to find some lost bits. Okay, to kick things off, let's have a listen to two unused music files that can be found in the game's soundtrack. Here, let's have a listen to the first song. This song was very likely to have been the original song used for the intro sequence. Interestingly enough, however, a section of this song did actually make it into the game's final intro theme that was used. The second unused track seems to have been an early version of the transition jingle when getting to the title screen. Again, a part of this track was eventually repurposed to be played in a scene towards the end of the game. Alright guys, next up we're gonna hop into my area of expertise. Interestingly enough, in the Japanese version of this game, there exist several unused NPC error messages. The catch is that you have to work some glitch magic in order to see them. Normally, early in the game, the south area of Toad Town will be blocked off by some logs, but by performing an out-of-bounds glitch, you can get past them and speak to the characters in this area before you're normally supposed to. For example, after using this glitch and then speaking to this bubble, he'll give you a magical seed. If you then speak to him again, he'll state, you shouldn't be able to get here yet. If you did, it's a bug. Please get in contact. Speaking to other denizens in the area will reveal other similar unused error messages, such as, this message shouldn't appear, so if it does, tell me right away. And, this message shouldn't appear, if it does, it's a bug. These were obviously left in as some sort of inside joke for beta testers and bug testers of the game to report if they discovered them. Like I mentioned, these are only found in the Japanese version of the game, and trying to speak to these NPCs in games from other regions will softlog the game instead. So that's not fun. And next up, let's have a look at some of the unused enemies found left over in the game's files. First up, we have the Albino Dinos, which although they do appear in the game, they only appear as living statues and are never actually fought in a battle. In battle, they were meant to be immune to fire attacks and their attack is to just charge and ram into Mario. What's even more cool is that Goombario even has a tattle for these dinos, which strongly suggests that they were planned to be fought until really late into the game's development. Goombario would say, This is an Albino Dino. Albino Dinos are the guards of this frosty place. Their defense power is huge, so let's reduce their HP steadily using our strongest damage dealing attacks. And similarly, Goombario has unseen tattle texts for two other enemies. The first of these unused enemies is a flying version of the Dark Koopas which are seen in the Toad Town tunnels called D Paratroopas. The D is for DAD. Unsurprisingly, they behave similarly to other paratroopas in the game. For these guys, Goombario was gonna say, This is a D Paratroopa. D paratroopas are the paratroopas who live in the Toad Town tunnels. Hammer attacks won't work on them because they're airborne. They'll lose their wings if you jump on them, and then they'll become Dark Koopas when they fall. But be careful, they do a dizzy attack once they're grounded. The other unused enemy with a Goombario tattle is another NPC who does actually appear in the game, but again, not as an enemy, Wacka the Mole. Now normally in the game, the tale of this Wacka is quite sad. Mario will hit him several times on the head in order to harvest the Wacka's bump item but every hit will cause this Wacka to progressively lose his memory. He didn't do anything to deserve this. Anyways, normally after the 8th time that you hit him, he will disappear after dropping a few coins, but it appears that at some point in development, after a few hits, Wacka would actually retaliate instead. In battle, Goombario would say, This is a Wacka. That bump on his head looks like a donut hole. You probably shouldn't have hit him so much, he looks a little peeved. 
As of the making of this video, no actual attacks for Wacka have been discovered. Instead, Wacka only has one move that only results in him growing a bump on his head, which soon after causes the game to crash. The ultimate revenge against Mario, if you ask me. There are also several unused enemy palettes for certain enemies left over in the game's files. These include an Aqua Fuzzy, a Blue Bandit, brighter versions of the Embers and Lava Bubbles, different palettes for the Crystal King, frosty versions of Goombas, Koopas and Porkies, as well as red versions of Goombas and Paragoombas. It's worth noting that this cut version of the Red Goomba should not be confused with the mini-boss that appears in the game, as they are apparently in two separate entries in the list of enemy names in the game's files. On a similar note, there also appears to be an unused party member left out of the final game. By using a game shark code, you can in fact add Goombaria to your party roster. Her name will appear at the end of the party member list, but will for some reason have the sprite of Cooper instead. Goombaria will follow Mario like every other partner, but she has no special overworld abilities programmed. She also doesn't have any battle attacks, and trying to battle with her will result in a game crash. My guess is that since Goombaria and Goombario are so similar, the development team had to decide between one or the other, and I guess it looks like Goombario won the vote. Now if there's one thing this game has a lot of, it's unused items. And I mean lots, like 50. So I'm just gonna go over the ones that I found most noteworthy. First up is an item called Please Come Back, which kind of looks like a shopping tag or something. The description for this item translates to, even partners sent away to somewhere can be brought back if you wish for them. It is believed that in earlier iterations of this game during development, Mario's partners could actually die in battle, and this item was gonna be used in order to revive them. Next up is an item referenced as Hustle Drink and this item would allow Mario to attack twice in one turn. It seems like a pretty cool and useful item, so I don't know why it would be cut. Other cool unused items that seem to have no effect in the game include a suspicious note, a gold vase, and a creepy looking toad doll. This game also has many badges that go unused. Most are useless or are just slight changes to existing badges, but there are also two unused badges in particular that are pretty interesting, Anger's Power and Right On. The Anger's Power Badge, which looks like an angry chain chomp, would cause Mario to darken and become angry, as seen in the also cut animation for this badge. It would also increase Mario's attack power by 6, but at the cost of losing all control over Mario's actions, leaving him to auto attack. The other badge, Right On, would allow Mario to perform action commands automatically and perfectly every time. This was obviously overpowered and it was likely just used for debugging purposes. There are also several unused sprites of items and badges found in the game without any description. These include a postcard, a parasol, a candy cane, as well as several silhouettes of other unused items. There's also one more unused sprite in the game's files, and that's of Princess Peach kissing someone, presumably Mario. It seems as though, as always, Mario wasn't deemed worthy enough to receive that kiss, even after everything he went through. Again. Yeesh! Alright guys, you already know what time it is, it's time for some more unused test rooms. And thankfully, Paper Mario has quite a few, so let's jump right in. First up is a room referenced as Machi, which can apparently be translated from Japanese to mean town. This room acts as sort of a hub area to other test rooms, but this room also has a few interesting things. As soon as you enter this room, you will notice a star rod that you can talk to. Unfortunately though, talking to it will cause the game to crash. One thing you've probably noticed by now is that things causing the game to crash are a common theme here. Next up on the left, you can see a small and large treasure chest, both likely just used to test opening mechanics. The small chest is empty, but the large one will have a hammer that will again cause the game to crash upon Mario receiving it. And moving along, we can find several blocks as well as switches again likely used for testing. Near this big blue switch, Miss Star can be seen, but upon Mario getting close to her, she will fly away. Next, there are interactive sprites of both Colorado and a regular Koopa NPC. Although they won't say anything when interacted with, talking to the Koopa will set Mario's max HP to 8, while Colorado will do the same, but set it to 11 instead. At the center of the map, you will find 5 mushroom items sitting in a row, as well as Goompa just chilling in the middle. His sprite appears to react like any enemy would in the game if you jump on him or hit him with a hammer. You can also walk right through him, which apparently just counts as several hits in a row. Yep, you read that right. In the middle of this area is the title Mario RPG. Now for those of you that don't know, Paper Mario was initially supposed to be a direct sequel to the SNES classic Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars, and it was initially supposed to be titled Super Mario RPG 2. 
But after certain complications, the game was renamed to Mario RPG 64, then to Super Mario Adventure, and then finally to Paper Mario outside of Japan. An original title screen of the game when it was still called Super Mario RPG 2 still exists as well. And while we're talking about it, it's really cool to see just how much Paper Mario has evolved during its development. From different user interfaces to even an entire different art style, many things were changed. Anyways, let's get back to the test rooms. Since the ground still has the original title, it is likely that this area was developed really early in the game's development stage. By now you probably also noticed that the numbers in this room look familiar. And you should, because they are the exact same number textures as seen in Super Mario 64. These numbered paths will either A. Do nothing, B. Take you to a later area in the game such as Mount Rugged or Crystal Palace, or C. Take you to another test room, and I'm sure you'll agree that is the most interesting out of the three, so let's keep going. Going through exit 7 will bring you into the room referenced as TST underscore zero one. In this room we can see the classic checkerboard flooring seen in many test rooms. There's also a few question mark blocks as well as a few hidden blocks containing either hearts or flowers. The next room over, TST underscore zero two, is another small room only containing a staircase, some blocks that have already been hit, as well as another set of small and large chests. This time, these chests are both empty. Kinda boring, but moving on to the next area we can find some more interesting stuff. First of all, it seems that Mario no longer needs sushi in this area, as he can now apparently just walk on water. And not only that, but he can even clip underneath the bridge here. It's kinda weird really. Across the first bridge you can see several blocks, including the heart and save blocks. There's also a power and a super block here as well. Hitting the power block unfortunately does nothing, and hitting the super block will, yet again, crash the game. And that's not all. In the same room there are also pits of spikes and lava that Mario must cross. Falling into either one of them will hurt Mario of course, but it'll also hurt your soul because, you guessed it, it crashes the game too. Is there anything that doesn't crash the game in this game? I'm not so sure. Wow, that's a lot of game crashing bugs, huh? Anyways, now on to room TST underscore 4. This room is when things get a bit peculiar. As you can already see, this room has Mario mirrored along the center of the area, likely to be a test for the mirroring used in Crystal Palace later in the game. This room also contains a set of rotating platforms, as well as one that moves up and down. Goompa and a red switch are also found here, but neither seem to really do anything. You can't move on from this room, so it's back to using more codes to access the rest of the rooms. So next up is room TST underscore 10, and this room is a large open area. This room has four colored arrows pointing you to walk around the area, and doing so will cause the camera to rotate. This area was likely to have been used to test the camera rotation mechanics used in the final game. Next is what appears to be an early version of the Crystal Palace. This time the reflections get even crazier, as now three Mario can be seen. You can even walk into the mirror so it's often hard to keep track of which one is the real Mario. Oh, and look at that! There's even a fourth Mario seen stuck inside the floor. This all seems like someone's bad dream, and I'm really not sure that that's supposed to look like that. But okay, gonna hand it right back to you Tetra. The next room is another weird one. In room TST underscore 13, there are two notable things. First, this weird ripple-like effect that distorts the ground wherever you go. And secondly, there's this long lineup of Koopas. But wait... These aren't any ordinary Koopas. They're... Your partners? Yep, for whatever reason, by interacting with these Koopas, they will transform into each of Mario's partners and three copies of Lucky Lester. Your guess as to why this is a thing is as good as mine. This room also lets you walk off the edge, which normally just respawns Mario back on the floor, but sometimes it can get really messy with the camera. And would you believe it, the oddities don't stop there. TST underscore 20 is a large room containing various random warp pipes, which do absolutely nothing. Great! One thing that is noteworthy about this room is the cool floor texture you can see here, which actually goes unused in the rest of the game, although it is similar to the one used in the Shooting Star Summit. And the last discovered test room is by far the biggest. Referenced in the game as MGM underscore 3, this room was likely one of the very first rooms to have been made, as all it has is various 3D modeled shapes. 
There are what appear to be three half spheres in the middle of the area, each with a different amount of polygons used, a small blue cylinder on the left edge, and a larger red cylinder on the right edge of the area, which can be seen going through the floor. And lastly, a huge hollowed out purple cylinder towards the back of the area, which you can try walking on. Now this isn't confirmed, but my guess would be that this was one of the very first rooms that the developers used to play around with the 3D modeling capability of the engine the game was developed on. Nonetheless, it's really cool that it was left over in the game's files for us to eventually find. Unfortunately, Paper Mario is one of those N64 games with a camera movement system that is less than ideal, so it did make exploration behind stuff a tad difficult. Again, if anyone out there knows a way to fix this, please let me know. That being said, there were a few noteworthy things that I was able to find. Many games hold models or sprites off screen in areas unseen to the player until they are needed to be loaded, and Paper Mario does this several times. Underneath certain areas, I was able to find sprites of the Red and Blue Goombas, Camella, Star Kids, and many others. Although nothing crazy, it was pretty exciting to discover many of these hidden sprites. On that same note, Ralph the Bad Shop Owner in Toad Town can be seen hiding just below ground. It's not until you get near his shop that you can see him pop up in his little shack. And lastly, later in the game you can unlock the Smash Attack minigame in which you have to try and guess where 10 portraits of Princess Peach are hidden. By moving the camera back, however, you can get a slightly unfair advantage as you can actively see where each bob will be hiding as their sprites can now be seen far below the floor. Even more interestingly is that in the Japanese version of this game, 10 Luigi sprites can be found under the floor too, but Luigi never ends up being called in this room. Some people believe that this is because initially, Mario would have to hit 10 boxes with the Luigi in them instead of the Peach portrait. This was likely removed because one Luigi is more than enough in this world. And with that concludes this Lost Bits video on Paper Mario and I really hope you guys enjoyed it. Paper Mario is one of my favorite N64 games, so I was glad to finally make a Lost Bits video on it. And a special thanks to Mikey Taylor Gaming for helping me out in this video as well. No, 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 thank you for having me, man. If you guys want to see more Paper Mario goodness, be sure to check out the glitch picnic that I just made with Tetrabit Gaming over at my channel as well by clicking on the card right here. Seriously, this game is absolutely full of glitches, so it's worth a watch. So I guess I'll see you there. And another special thank you to Strider7x for providing footage for some stuff. I would have never been able to do some of these things in a million years. And if you'd like to stay even more up to date with me and my channel, be sure to follow me on Twitch, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Links to all those will be in the description below. And as always guys, thank you all so much for watching today and for all of your amazing support, and I will see you in a bit.